you take a seat. Those of you who are on my right towards the end, kindly settle down. Those of you near the doors, kindly sit down because our guests will arrive. The middle row, there are three people who are standing. Could you all please settle down? A reminder to all the students and participants, kindly put your mobile phones on silent. I urge all of you to please check and ensure your phones are on silent. <laughs> Students in the first row, please settle down. Could you please direct those two, two, two students to take their seats? <laughs> Vidisha ma'am, there are two students. Can you ask them to sit down, please? I think we need to uh, listen to instructions and follow it. Please understand, it's difficult to come there and ask you to sit down individually. Just listen to instructions and go by that. Suppose that you have a chance to interact with the Honourable Minister, so if you have any questions pertaining to his talk or anything about his uh, general career and so on that you wish to ask, please raise your hands. We have volunteers who will bring the mics to you. After that, we have a very short closing remark and vote of thanks, followed by the National Anthem. Once the National Anthem is done, again please remain standing in your places till the dignitaries exit. Post that, once we get a signal that he has boarded his car, we will allow you to leave. So you will have to wait for a couple of minutes till uh, the Honorable Minister leaves. Right? Thank you so much.
we have the vice chancellor reverend dr father victor lobo sj escorting the chief guest along with the leadership of the university the pro vice chancellors the registrar the coe dr shweta raghavan and deans of various schools with the pro i request the dignitaries to take we their seats the vice on chancellor the dais. Reverend Dr. Father Victor Lobo is here. I request the dignitaries to take their seat on the dais. Along with the leadership of the university, audience kindly remain standing as we will have the university annual meeting. The COE in a moment. Dr. Shweta Raghavan, 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 Dr. Sh
enhance like the efficiency of public health care in the state and putting together an e-management system to weed out corruption, dogging health care. Under his leadership, the government launched the Peace of Punit Rajkumar Art Health Scheme, Rudhiya Jyoti, in memory of actual and philanthropist, late Dr. Punit Rajkumar, to provide emergency treatment and health care facilities for cardiac patients and to cater to the cardiac health care under his leadership of the poor and the general public. It is the first scheme of its kind in the entire country. This evinces that Sri Ganesh Kundura possesses a vision for strengthening Karnataka's health care system from meeting victims of acid attacks to directing officials to ensure that victims get all the facilities from the health department to the victims to bearing the treatment costs to visiting and inspecting hospitals, listening to the grievances of the public and taking necessary administrative measures to serve more people. Sri Dinesh Kundura has emerged as a role model to ensure efficiency, integrity and organizational capabilities. A noted alumnus of Bishop Cotton Boys High School Bangalore and BMS College of Engineering Baswan Budi where he completed his Bachelor of Engineering in Electronics and Communications. Sri Kundura has been bold, outspoken without succumbing to any intimidation gives his honest opinion on matters but politely, especially on the quality of health services is provided. His father, late Rama Gundu Rao, was the Chief Minister of Karnataka from 1980 to 1983. Sri Dinesh Gundu Rao is a well-spoken man which you will witness shortly for yourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Sri Dinesh Gundurav. Thank you, sir, for that warm welcome and introduction of sir. I now invite Sri Dinesh Gundurav ji to occupy the seat of honor for felicitation. I request all the dignitaries on the dais to felicitate the Honorable Minister of Health and Family Welfare, Government of Karnataka, Sri Dinesh Gundurav. So please take a seat. one of our top priorities, not just as individuals, but also as a collective for the progress of our nation. It is both an individual responsibility as well as of those who are in leadership roles to make healthcare accessible and affordable to everyone. I now invite Sri Dinesh Gundurauji to deliver his keynote address on the topic, citizen-centric approach to governance on health and well-being. Hello everyone, Namaskara. Good morning, good morning. St. Joseph's University, Ali, you are to Radita Artakanta, E. Karekramadali, Vedi Kemela Asin Radanta, Reverend Father Victor Lobo, 
ಹಾಗೂ ಪ್ರೊ ವೈಸ್ ಚಾನ್ಸಲರಾದಂಥ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ರೆಜಿನಾ ಮತಾಯಸ್ ಅವರೇ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಮೋಹನ್ ದಾಸ್ ಅವರೇ ಮತ್ತು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಮೆಲ್ವಿನ್ ಕೋಲಾಸೋ ಅವರೇ ಹಾಗೂ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶ್ವೇತಾ ರಾಘವನ್ ಅವರೇ ಹಾಗೂ ಬಂದಿರುವ ಎಲ್ಲ ಸೆಂಟ್ ಜೋಸೆಫ್ಸ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿಯ ಎಲ್ಲ ಪ್ರತಿಭಾವಂತ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿನಿಯರೇ ಆಲ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೆಂಟ್ ಜೋಸೆಫ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಯು ವನ್ಸ್ ಅಗೇನ್ so it gives me great pleasure to be here in this wonderful campus and this lovely auditorium where we will be discussing and talking about subjects connected to health well being and governance and uh, these are all very important subjects and uh, as you very well know the world health day was yesterday and the slogan for the world health day uh, that has been given is my health my right so it's in a way uh, the statement that it addresses is that uh, to have good health is a fundamental right of every person in this world and uh, as far as our country goes though health is not specifically been mentioned in the constitution as a fundamental right there is the article 21 which says right to life and i think if you expand that uh right to life uh it means there is scope to say that right to health is also a fundamental right um but uh despite that there is no specific uh, legislation in the country that says uh health is a fundamental right like how we say education is a fundamental right and there so many other rights to freedom of expression rights to liberty and rights to so many other fundamental rights but this has not yet been uh, enacted upon i think the only state in the country that has enacted a right to health as a, as a law is rajasthan that was done last year uh, by the congress government there when it was ruling and uh, they came out with a very progressive policy of course state being i mean health being a both a central and a state subject it's also well within our own rights in karnataka to also maybe think of coming out with right to health but in a way we do have we can we are very close to uh, having health as a fundamental right in our state also uh, because we have a very extensive uh, uh, health assurance scheme which covers all the people who are you know below poverty line uh, that covers almost 85% of our population and uh, they they get uh, coverage rise of up to 5 lakhs uh, that is also part of our state policy and also the national policy also covers the same amount 5 lakhs whereas the one in rajasthan uh, the right to i mean the in the assurance on health in rajasthan is uh, 25 lakhs so uh, i think you know that is something that we also need to look at uh, in terms of legislation in making you know enhancing this uh, limit so whatever uh, that may be so this covers the 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 aspect of my health my right but i think also there is another word that needs to be added to my health my right and the, the word that needs to be added to my health my right is my health my right my responsibility i think a lot of health is also our own responsibility uh, your health is in your hands also and there's so many things that we can do to ensure that uh, we are able to live good healthy lives and to be you know uh, to have uh, Uh, a lifestyle that promotes your uh, your own well being so i think there is not that we, we can't just say that health is something that the government has to look after and it is their duty to do it and i've got nothing to do with it i think every person i think has got a lot to do with it and today uh, it's a huge subject on how uh, things uh, in health are also dependent upon how we live and the way the kind of life that we lead now uh, just now the reverend was saying that you know non communicable diseases are increasing so what does non communicable diseases mean earlier in the days maybe 20 years 30 years 40 years 50 years 60 years back you used to see a lot of deaths and lot of people dying or, or getting ill and facing lot of health conditions due to communicable diseases people used to die of um, measles or typhoid or 
you know, cholera or, you know, all kinds of communicable diseases which existed and which still do, ex which still exists. But treatments have been found, cures have been found, and today the proportion of people having serious health, health ailments due to communicable diseases is dropping, and the non-communicable diseases are increasing. So what are the non-communicable diseases? I'm sure you know what are the non-communicable diseases are. Anyone knows what non-communicable diseases are? Specifically? Any one word that you can think of? Yeah, cancer. You can think of strokes, you can think of your cardiac problems, you can think of kidney problems. All these are non-communicable diseases. And these, of course, there is a genetic uh, link to some of these diseases. And uh, if you are genetically inclined to get one of these uh, diseases, then yes, tough luck. Uh, but you have to manage it and you have to cope with it. But uh, the prevalence of these diseases are increasing. The incidence of these diseases are increasing. And another slightly more alarming uh, factor that is creeping in is the age at which people are getting these diseases is decreasing. So I think uh, we cannot think of cancer, heart attacks as something that can happen to old people anymore or it's not for, for us right now, we don't have to think about it. I think it is there, at, uh, you know, for all of, all of us to think of, and it's something that is well within our control to even prevent the onset of these diseases. And that is linked to the way we live and the lifestyle that we lead. And that starts at a young age, the age when we start, the way we lead life, we live life. Uh, Having good physical activity is one major issue that all of us should have some sort of physical activity going on in our lives. And the other more important aspect is, is the kind of food that we eat, the kind of, uh, you know, things that, habits that we have. So these have got long-term implications. And early onset of blood pressure, early onset of diabetes, all leads to complications in your life in the future. And as you grow older, these catch up, and many of uh, people are succumbing to these kind of ailments. So this is something that we have to think of. My life, of course, the government has to step in, government has to do its best to provide good health, and that is something that we are all working at. And all of you know how things work in this country. Nothing is easy, because of the vastness of, uh, you know, the scale at which India works. For example, I would just like to say, Say, for us in Karnataka, the number of hospitals that we have, we have about 42 district hospitals, we have 146 taloka hospitals, we have uh, community health hospitals, which are 204, primary health centers, which are 2,508, and our health and wellness centers, sub-centers, we have 9,334. And we've got more than 40, 45,000 people working in our department. And uh, to manage all this and to ensure good services and uh, to be able to deliver on what we, uh, uh, we have promised the people is something that is not so easy, uh, given the way that we uh, work. Uh, you know, government is definitely not the most efficient system the, the, that is working, uh, uh, you know, as an as a establishment. There are so many weaknesses in our system. So the challenges are huge. So the role of government is definitely very important. No doubt about it. The, you know, what we can do, what we can contribute, and how we can uh, do things, and how we can reach, you know, the health care to the, uh, the poorest to the poor. People living in villages, people living in small towns. How can they get the access to medications, access to, you know, uh, consultations? So these are the challenges that we face uh, when we are talking about governance, and uh, when we talk about, you know, uh, being able to ensure that our, our people get more healthy. Because for us, it's, though health is very important, somehow for every government, the priority is always other things, and uh, health always gets a slightly lesser priority. Like in terms, uh, ideally, 2.5% of your GDP should be given to health, and 2.5% should be given to education. But we never have, we haven't reached those numbers yet. We are still 
well below that. We are around 1, 1.2%, 1.3% of our GDP is given to health. So budgets becomes a problem. But at the same time, in Karnataka, for example, we are doing many things. Some of it has already been mentioned uh, uh, in the introduction. So we are doing many things to see that we improve within the, uh, within the circumstances. So that is using different technologies, using uh, you know, uh, 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 latest uh, available knowledge and information, uh, telemedicine, so that healthcare from the uh, rural areas are connected to the, uh, uh, the urban centers and the specialists. So we are working on all that. No doubt uh, it is a work in progress and it's constant. There is no end to it. There's no limits to it. Uh, I can work 24 hours a day also and still it's not enough. That that, that's the amount of work that is there that needs to be done. So that is something that is important. But along with that, yes, of course, we have to deliver our medicines. We have to have doctors. We have to have nurses. We have to have pharmacists. We have to have technicians. And they should be working. And uh, we are doing many things. Uh, like, uh, like, for example, now we want to ensure that every district hospital in our state uh, in the within the next few months, we'll be ensuring that all our people can get free CT scans and free MRIs in Karnataka. That's something so that they can get access to that. And we are having this tele-ICU where all our taluk hospitals are connected to the specialist hospitals in headquarters like Mysore, Bangalore, so that our specialist doctors can monitor our patients living in the taluk hospitals who are in ICUs there. Now, we have also, in, in terms of mental health, we have initiated new schemes with, tied up with NEMANS, Brain Health Initiative, Telemanus, all these things, so that mental health, again, is also another very important issue. So uh, there are many things that we are doing, and I can go on talking about it, and I don't want to bore you also on that, because that will take too much time and too much data and statistics and all that. But our aim is, one is treatment. But the bigger, the more important aspect to health, I think, is the preventive part. We should, as far as possible, prevent or detect early any onset of disease. I think that is the biggest challenge that we have, because the earlier you detect, if you prevent, fantastic. But the earlier you detect, the easier the cure, and the cost also reduces. And that is something I think we are going to be launching a a uh, new program just after these elections get over. We have called it the Griha Arogya Scheme, where our people, we have taken eight districts, so every person in that district, we will be uh, um, screening them. We'll be testing them for, you know, blood pressure, diabetes, certain early, uh, you know, cancers, and our people will be going to the doorstep. And anyone who's got blood pressure or diabetes, we want to deliver free medicines to them, to their doorstep. They need not come to our clinics, they need not come to hospitals. Our medicines will go to their house because if we can control diabetes and BP at an early stage, that itself prevents uh, kidney disease, AMR, antimicrobial uh, uh, resistance, which is another serious problem, uh, where when we talk about AMR, it's people who are using medicines without proper prescriptions, just buying antibiotics off the counter and, you know, uh, abuse of medicines. So this is leading to resistance to medi medications. And that is leading to, you know, huge problems across the world today. It's AMR is, is one of the major problems that we're facing. So these are the things that we are looking at to tackle at the governance level. But along with that, I think, uh, health is not just about health in terms of disease or just uh, about the uh, in, just in terms of how we are feeling or how 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 we are yeah, uh, you know anything that we have got any problems that we have on our body or in our mind mental health also is another serious issue but it's also the wellness and well-being and if you look at india we are a proud nation we are a old nation we've got a great civilization we talk about our great fantastic wonderful history and past and all that, which is good, great. We have a great culture and we are a mixed society. We've got languages and castes and religions and 
communities and traditions, so much variation. I don't think there's any other country in the world which has got uh, so much variation and variety in one single country. But if you look at our happiness index, I think many people may have known or studied it, we are one of the most unhappy people in the world. And it is not that we are improving, it's getting worse. I was just looking at the data and uh, the latest data shows that, I just picked it up today morning, that the latest data is showing that out of 143 countries in the world, we are at 126. We are less unhappy than even our neighboring countries. Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, we are less unhappy than Pakistan also. Normally we target Pakistan for everything. So we are less unhappy than them. And it's very easy to just dismiss these facts and say that, oh, this is some report, forget about it. There's some biased report. And today that's become the norm in our country. Any report or any, any statement or any fact that comes which is seemingly negative about a country, oh, that's a biased report. Or they are, they are doing it for, with some other intention. There's a conspiracy against this country. Or George Soros is up to something. Somebody is up to something. The, you know, we should, by not looking at the facts, or by, by not looking at the reality, you can't escape from it. You can't just wish it away and assume that things are fine. So why is it that, what is the problem? So when it comes to health, health and the title is on health and well-being, so well-being is just not about our health, it's also the way we live, the, society, the, the, the societal aspects, the environmental aspects, and the, 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 the openness that a society should have. Every society, that especially a country like India, where we have always valued our freedoms, we have valued our, you know, we can say anything we want, we can express our views without getting a barrage of criticism and uh, negativity. So if you look at the way things have been going on in this country, there is also a certain worry for us that are we becoming a divided country? Are we becoming like a country of extreme views where there is a right and there's a left and the people who are in the middle are literally cannot be heard because uh, their voices never really come out so strongly. So only the extreme views that are coming out, and especially one extreme view from the right, is not pushing the country into a, into a situation where, you know, either you are with them or you are against them. And if you are not with them, then you are against the country, you are against the nation, you are against us, you are against... You know, this us and them is psychologically, I think, playing a huge role in our society. And it is like a... something which is unknown, it's like a poison spreading, very quietly, but very effectively and very fast, and polluting people's minds. Where we get, we are forming biased views. We are, f we are forming fixed views. A certain so a person, if, 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 if he's from a certain community, oh, he must be an anti-national. Or oh, these, are, these are people who are not deshbhaktas. You know? So this kind of distortion that is taking place, it's dystopian, they can say. This, the word is dystopian, where you're living in a different a, a bubble that is created around you, and we, you start believing facts which are not true, but made to believe that it's true. And facts which need to be learned and need to be understood are being completely brushed away or not coming to the forefront. And it is a, a new form of society that is emerging in this country, which is very worrisome for all of us. Because once the freedom to express and to live the way you want, to dress the way you want, to eat what, what you want, to live, you know, in, in whichever way you feel is correct, as long as you're not hurting somebody else or not hurting anybody's, uh, you know, uh, them personally or their sensibilities, that should never be compromised. The minute we start compromising on that, that affects the well-being of society. And if the well-being of society gets affected, it affects the well-being of the individual, the person. There's no getting away from it. You can't just wish away and think that we will we'll live like this and this is, this is the way it is and nothing's going to happen to, to me. Let them do whatever they want. This is not my problem. It is going to be a problem. Today, if it's not your problem, today, tomorrow is going to be a children's problem. So this broader debate, I'm not saying that any one view should be correct. I think there's no perfect view. 
there's no one view which is the ultimate view because every view has got different uh, a positive and a benef and a negative but there should be a scope there should be a space where people can communicate say talk and debate and disagree and then move on but here today what's happening in this country if you look at the way debates are taking place there is no debate you look put on any tv channel today just now uh, father said there was a, that was the last secular channel i will not i'll not want to use the word secular i'd like to say that was the last neutral channel that was there ndtv today if you put on any tv channel times now republic news x any channel they don't want to discuss what is the what is affecting the lives of the people it's just promotion and propaganda that is going on unnecessary debates are taken unnecessary issues are taken and blown out as long as you distract the person's mind move them away from the reality what are the realities that for example there was a de there was a demonetization that was done in this country which was actually a disaster it hit our gdp by 2% in that one year our india gdp dropped almost 2% and what does a drop of gdp mean it means almost 3 one gdp is almost 1 and 1/2 lakh crore so a 2% drop is almost 3 lakh crore rupees washed away wiped out and who did it affect the most the common man the ordinary person till today has anyone come and discussed with us what was the benefit of demonetization was it an effective scheme what was the need for it has there been a debate has anyone questioned the government on that has government even bothered to reply they don't want to reply because they feel that we need we need not reply whereas in every front on demonetization we failed they said it will wipe out black money today there is more black money than there ever was they said they'll it will wipe out terrorism there is terrorism still exists all over all kinds of reasons were given so when you don't hold people accountable and let them get away that leads to distortion that leads to false narratives that leads to you know ultimately society getting impacted in a very negative manner so this is i think something that is really worrying all of us and especially today we are in the middle, middle of elections and the future of the country is getting decided we we are seeing people being jailed chief ministers being sent to jail we are seeing ministers being sent to jail fine if they are corrupt send them no problem anyone who speaks against the government they go to jail or they are harassed or you know look at the uh, look at the electoral bond scheme it was a scheme which is nothing but legal bribery legal bribery legalized form of form of bribery i'll tell you how you send ed it cbi to a person's house it's all established if they don't and if those people are forced to buy bonds if they if they don't buy bonds then they are harassed by ed it cbi and it's nothing but threatening blackmail and extortion so we said it is not good why should you you know conceal the identity of people who are contributing that was not mentioned till the supreme court finally said this is unconstitutional this is illegal when electoral bonds were issued rbi said don't do it election commission said don't do it but the government went ahead so what i'm trying to say is every government makes mistakes it's fine to make mistakes but it's also very important to realize that you made a mistake don't say that i have made a mistake but don't talk about it i'm still going to go ahead with what i'm doing so or well, as a society why i'm bringing this topic in here is also because when you talk about health and well being it's also how we are protecting our people how we are protecting our society and what kind of society we want so that is something i think all of you as young minds today you are on the cusp of probably all of you are voters all of you have got id cards so i hope all of you vote and take some interest in what is happening and not get lost in your own worlds around your mobiles and ipads and your social media and everything because you can get lost in that and get also get lost and get sidetracked because what's happening with social media and all that is affecting the mental health of people they are becoming inward looking they are becoming they are living in their own bubbles they are losing attachments with people families are getting disrupted 
even conversations are getting disrupted. Parents and uh, children sitting together and talking together is also getting disrupted. Nobody sits and watches a movie together anymore. You go to anyone's house today, I don't think anybody sits together and watches a movie today. Each one is watching their own movie at their own time and uh, on their own screen. So once these are the things which also affects the well-being, no? The, and uh, the way family functions, the way we are together, the, the way we can sit together with different kinds of people and still have a go good conversation. So these are the things I think, you know, is a, again connected to, which connects to health and well-being. And for, this is for the people who can, you know, you are, the, you are the people who are the future of this country. You are the bright minds. You are the people who are more empowered, more enabled than many, many people who don't have access to the kind of education that you had. There are so many people, almost 60% of this country does not have this kind of access to education that you had. So you should be the, the future torch bearers. And if you yourself are, are confined to a certain way of living and thinking, and you cannot really maximize your own potential to the way you can contribute to society, that's a serious loss to us. It's a serious loss to us as a nation. Because we want questioning minds. We want minds which will challenge. We want minds which will not obey or which, which, which will not conform. We want minds which will open up things, debate things, talk about things in a free and fair manner. And that is the, what your mind should be all about. You should be able to discuss and talk and, you know, that, that is what will make our society a creative and a free society. Not to say, yes, so-and-so said this, so he is right. So-and-so said that. Your own opinions, your own thinking, thought processes, that is important. Because you are the people who are more empowered than the others. You've got a greater, you, you, you're in a position which is slightly ahead of many people in this country. So... That is what I would like to tell all of you, that please don't get caught up and live in a bubble, open up your minds. Yes, I think this society in the last 10, 15 years is a society which has got caught with this. Future societies will improve on this because we are realizing the negativities of this. We are realizing the impact on our health. We are realizing the impact on mental health. Recently, I had a, we had a discussion on this and how mental health has become a serious issue because of the way we are living. Young people are under distress, under, they are sad, they've got agonies, they've got problems. There are so many, you know, stresses. So this is happening and this has to change by us getting aware of it. You have to realize that yes, there is a problem, no. We have to realize that we have to accept that there's a problem and then work on it. And I think this generation, your generation, is the, I think, generation which has gone through this. The, forthcoming generations, I think, if we realize and educate our people, educate our parents, educate our elders, educate all of the youngsters, say that we should not, we should not get caught up with this. We need to open up. We need to, you know, use our technologies, use social media, use this huge amount of information that is coming, inflowing into us in a way which enhances us, enhances our relationships, enhances our interpersonal conversations and make, make us better as individuals and as a group. That is the thing. It's not just a single person or me alone. It, as a group, as a society, everyone should get uplifted. So I think uh, that is something that we, I, me as a health minister, we discuss, are discussing these issues, how we can tackle these problems, how we can improve and how we can communicate these issues, even at the stage of education. Sir, since you're all edu uh, educationists, even in school education and and college education. We need to bring in subjects where people realize the impacts of these things so that they learn about it. They learn that what, what could happen to you if you lead the kind of life that uh, you may lead uh, with the kinds of you know, food habits, technology, all these things, so that they should understand and realize. And in fact, we've written to our education department from health department that from next year onwards, in our PUC and uh, high school, we're gonna have a subject, a chapter on impacts of health and, and uh, uh, an impact of environment on, on your lives and on, on, on your well-being. So that is something that we're going to be doing in, in, the, in the government sector. So these are the few things that I wanted to tell you. I think my time is up. Question and answer. Question and answer? OK, I've got anyway, lots more to say, but I'll, I'll, I won't say more. Maybe in the question and answer, I will 
bring that up and discuss it. So uh, I would just wanted to highlight the issues that health and well-being is connected to many things. Our own lives, the way we live, to improve our health systems, to, for the government to do, uh, do its job, and at the same time, as a society, it's not just an individual, as a society, as a nation, as a country, we need to realize it and work towards it and think about these things. So I hope that uh, today, whatever I've spoken to, to all of you uh, will have some impact on your minds and you will start thinking on these lines and you know, let's all work towards for a better India and a more happy India. We want an India where everyone is more happy and you know, uh, and, who ca and everyone can uh, uh, reach and maximize each one's potential. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for that very engaging and insightful talk. You very efficiently highlighted the, us and informed us about the current situation of healthcare, as well as your future plans for uh, the healthcare sector. Also, it's important that you send out a very important message to our students, because they are the change makers and the future of the nation, that we both we need a healthy, as well as a happy India in the future. Thank you very much, sir. The floor is now open for Q&A. We will have the student volunteers around, uh, whoever have questions, student volunteers, kindly hand over the mic to them. Those who have questions can raise your hands in turns. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Uh, we are all very glad here to see you here today. So my question was, what is the initiative taken by the government uh, to tackle the issues of substance abuse and addictions? Well, uh, you know, that's an issue which doesn't come directly to my department as such. But overall, the, there are two, three aspects <coughs> to it. One is, of course, making people aware. You know, like recently we came out with a, uh, a ban on, uh, you know, hookah bars yeah. in, the, in, in Karnataka. Uh, because we found that, okay, one is tobacco is bad, everybody knows it. But at the same time in the hookah bars, I don't know whether many, any of you visited, I'm sure many of you would have visited here. <laughs> okay. So what we found was many of these hookah bars were mixing substances in their hookahs. And to make people, you know, use it more. So there was no uh, way of monitoring it and there's no way of... Uh, so that is one aspect that we did. Then, of course, we are... Even tobacco control, we have now made it uh, legally that below 21 years, you cannot buy cigarettes. So I do not know how many of you are below 21, about 21. <laughs> so that's another thing. And drug menace is an issue that is, has to be tackled by the law and order, police, tra drug trafficking, you know, serious issues where... Uh, we try to, we see so much of use of marijuana, use of other serious uh, narcotics. So that is a multi-prone attack, which is not just India, but across the world that we are facing. So I think one is we have to build awareness amongst our people and anyone who's doing, and this is more at a younger age. Uh, the, all studies show that people at young ages are the ones who get into this. And once you cross a certain age, then the chances of you getting addicted to any of these substances reduces dramatically. So it's either it's well within 21, or even I would go lower, well before you're 18 is when you actually pick up the habits. So I think awareness is a, becomes a very key part of this. Okay? Is that okay? Check. Could we have another mic? The next question could be passed on if that's done. Hello. Uh, Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. My name is Mohamed Shoaib Shakil. I'm a student from mass communication and journalism. So I have a question for you, sir. From the recent times, there's been outbreak of cases of cholera uh, for horses in Bayamglo Medical College. And also there was a case of cholera detected in Malaysia from a PG, a man who was staying in a PG. So we're all students who stay in majority hostels and PGs. What initiatives is the government taking to address these challenges? And additionally, how does the government plan to ensure availability of safe drinking water to prevent future outbreaks in the future, especially in densely populated areas like Bangladesh, as observe World Health Day. 
Yeah, see, there's no, uh, there's no cholera outbreak as such. There are some reported cases of cholera, and the one in Malayalam was not cholera. It was when it was the test was done, it was proved that it wasn't cholera. But the one in the medical college hostel, uh, there, see, cholera would have come. I think uh, Shweta Raghavan will know her better because she is an expert in this. Basically, it's from the uh, bad quality of water, or even from you know poor quality food, is where you can you can get these uh, these infections. And uh, so to have best practices in terms of safe drinking water, heat, uh, heat your water and drink, or have some purifier, that's one of the ways. And not to eat contaminated food and be careful, you know, what food you're eating. So the one in the Bangalore Medical College, I think few people have been have tested for cholera. Yeah. So right, sir, two of the students have been uh, uh, yeah. positive of cholera yeah. right, as of now, yeah. but the other two, the other yeah, yeah, I'm just saying so. that some of them have have got cholera. Yes. And uh, they they uh, come positive. So cholera is a treatable disease. Not that it's not, it's not a uh, difficult disease to treat, but it should not spread. And that is basically through these practices. So the, already we have given out advisories. We have had meetings across the state with all our district officers, taluk officers, and there in turn have all advertised. You know, uh, advising everyone. So it's also an individually say in your in a PG hostel. It's also the individual's responsibility to see that. The water is safe, and that's I think the key uh, component. So, just a follow-up question: uh, Is the government taking any measures to ensure that there is certain level of hygiene maintained in PGs and hostels across the city? Pardon? As Has the government taking any initiatives yeah. towards the PGs and hostels throughout the city? Yeah, yeah. we have given out instructions to all all educational institutions, all uh, you know, uh, hotels, restaurants, uh, the corporations. Uh, all of them also have been uh, taken on board. So this kind of advisory goes out to everybody. Uh, now it's uh, also, uh, whether it's cholera or whether it, uh, extreme heat in Karnataka, so heat strokes. So there the, are the number of report cases of heat strokes also which are coming up. So on these things, uh, every institution and uh, across the state, we've given out advisories. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I request students to uh, restrict their questions to only one uh, due to paucity of time. Yes, we have any other students? Yes. Oh, very good morning, sir. I'm Pratik. I'm a student of journalism and international relations here. So I'll keep my question short. Uh, you spoke about Telemanas and the brain health program, and uh, there's also Mana Chaitanya. While yeah. these initiatives exist, uh, I think the more prevalent problem with mental health is the stigma that surrounds it and the fear of seeking help. So what exactly is the government planning to do to make uh, mental health more accessible and uh, to make the system more you know, progressive and make it easier for youngsters as well as adults to access the existing programs? See, one is we've set up a telemanas where people can, anybody can call up uh, on that number and they will get access to uh, consultation and uh, advice and what to do, where to go next, depending upon the person's, uh, what problem they're facing, whether it's sleep disorder, whether it's any other issue, psychosis, or any issue that they're facing. So that is one thing. And of course, the Brain Health Initiative that we have, for, which we, we, we have launched in, the, uh, in Karnataka is the first one in the country, where every district is, we've got a center. Uh, with the professionals, therapists there, who are linked to NIMHANS. So we are I'm proud to say that Karnataka is number one in terms of mental health in the country today. The way we are doing things, we are na na the number one state, and uh, we have 10 lakh consultations already that have, that, that have come to us through public health institutions and through these calls. So we are, you know, and advocacy, I think, becomes important. So advocacy in terms of, people going and talking to people everywhere, uh, in colleges, in, uh, in, uh, in universities, in uh, very other institutions, uh, like even our own people, like even in the government, our police staff, our teachers, uh, even I would say even MLAs and ministers, everyone should become an advocate. So that advocacy is something that we are looking at key, uh, keenly now because there's a stigma attached to it. Like you said correctly, there's a stigma and there's a discrimination. And when you say mental health, people tend to you know think that you're a little bit crazy or whatever. So, whereas it's a serious problem. So I think uh, advocacy becomes a key part component, and uh, we are now we're going to be working on advocacy a lot. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Do we have more questions? Any more questions? We'll go over the last question in that case. The one there, the back. 
Uh, good morning, sir. I'm uh, Kushal Varma from Mascom uh, and Journalism Department. Uh, so the central government has uh, failed to uh, provide funds for drought relief. Uh, so with regards to that, apart from that uh, previous year, nearly 500 farmers have committed suicide. So the, obviously the farmers, uh, there's mental uh, distress due to the drought problem and uh, suicides have been occurring. So. Uh, what can be done to uh, address that issue from your side? See, now, what can I do if the union government is not willing to do its job? I have, I have had no option than to go to the Supreme Court today. I think for the first time, Karnataka government has gone to Supreme Court against the union government, saying that when you are duty-bound to give us money for drought relief, and uh, you have not done. So that is something which is not correct on their part. So. Uh, we have done on our own whatever we could, almost a few thousand crores we have spent giving it to our uh, farmers, along with our guarantee schemes, which are also helping everyone uh, in terms of social security and protection. But I think uh, this unfortunately has become a legal, pro a legal fight now, because government of India has refused to give us even one penny. And Karnataka is one of the states which contributes highest to this country's uh, uh, you know, taxes. We are the number three in, uh, in the country. And uh, out of every 100 rupees that we give government of India, we get back only 12 to 13 rupees. So when, 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 we, when we are in distress, it is their duty to see that they help. And every government has helped before. Whether it is BJP or whether it is Congress, every government, whenever there is drought or floods, they are under the disaster management authority. They have to help us. But the excuse that they are giving now is, you heard Nirmala Sitaram he was here day before. She said that uh, the report we have given it to the election commission, and it's on hold, which is complete nonsense because we gave the reports in October. And they're saying, I, I sent the, uh, the, uh, the committee report to election commission in March. So what were they doing for six months? So, you know, it's what, what is affecting here is drought is one issue. But what is affecting is center state relations. This is a federal state country where states and center have to work as a union. But if the union becomes headstrong, and say this is my way or the highway, then we have no other option than to fight it out in public in the streets or go to courts and demand our rights. Karnataka has gone to court, Kerala has gone to court, Tamil Nadu has gone to court, Tamil Nadu for floods, Kerala for getting some uh, financial assistance, loans, and Karnataka for drought relief. So this is, this is something that should not happen. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? We have time for one more question. One last question, please. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, actually, a recent uh, issue was like water crisis uh, issues. Uh, now, water crisis has been in the down level. So what are the precautions have government taken to uh, the, uh, cure the disease of like water stagnant? like water uh, in the dams are reached to a certain level where it's not fully. So there will be some or the other uh, um, disease or some or the other uh, virus uh, in the water. So... Well, I don't know what exactly you're trying to ask me here. So, um, so you're saying there are viruses in the water which is there in the dams? Yeah. Well, I don't think that is uh, true or correct. Well, that's a storage of water, and that water flows. Once the dams open, the water starts flowing, and it comes in the rivers, and then it goes to the cities, and it. Yeah. And so, so. And then that water is ultimately, before it comes to you as to your yeah. house, gets treated, and then it comes to you. Yeah. Because uh, there will be some, uh, you know, uh, pollutants in the uh, river water, but that gets treated, and then finally it comes to your house. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, maybe one last question. And we will close the Q&A session. There are lots there on top. <laughs> they can't reach you there. Maybe you all can email us your questions. And if so, would be free to answer them at another point in time. Uh, due to paucity of time, this is our last question that we're going to be taking. Please go ahead. Good morning, sir. Uh, as you said, my life, my right, my responsibility. So as the Honorable Minister, what are some steps that you are practicing or suggest the government practice further to prevent the infectious disease or outbreaks, intense heat waves, and the water crisis that we've seen recently? 
See, water crisis is another issue, but I would say that we can use technologies to be able to track onset of infections. Like now we are working with the Institute of Science, Indian Institute of Science, uh, where we are trying to track early detection of outbreak of dengue. So, you know, they have they've come out with a, a, a certain uh, protocol and an app and everything, software, where, where they get data from across the states, real time, and whenever some uh, uh, spikes in certain disease starts uh, starts happening, they warn us in advance. So that's for dengue is what we are working on since last uh, September. So if those th kind of things are things that we can do to be able to uh, uh, you know uh, predict, it's called I think it's called predictive analysis. So whether we can so for for that you need good data. So we are trying to you know computerize the whole system, get more data from all the regions of Karnataka. So that whenever there is a spike in, say, uh, dengue or chikungunya or maybe even cholera, we get advance, uh, you know, uh, notice, and we can then start taking preemptive measures. That's something that we are doing. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, audience, for your active participation, and sir, thank you for graciously answering all the questions raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been a very kind audience. And now, ask me any tough questions. <laughs> I now invite Dr. Shweta Raghavan, Professor of Practice SJU, to present the closing remarks. Good afternoon. For a change, uh, they've been very vert vertically challenged, friendly. Someone's very politely put in a little step here for me. Thank you so much. I can see you well. I'd like to begin by saying perhaps we got the timing wrong. I've heard that uh, our former chief minister, Sri Gundurauji, was very well known for passing government orders from where he is. Perhaps we should have called Dinesh Ji at a time when there was no model core of conduct. So, sir, we hope you will come back again at a future date. And hopefully, you will all come up with some suggestions where we can have some geos passed right from here. But to keep it uh, short and simple, I would like to thank the minister for taking his time out and uh, just summarize a few things that I've learned from his speech today. One is there are two, two major pillars of ensuring there is good governance. Um, and he very beautifully, eloquently put them across as accountability and, and transparency. And with these two sitting, uh, these two as co-pilots, I think the plane, will, plane on good governance will take off really well. Having said that, it was also very refreshing to know that uh, government and uh, politically elected representatives will now knock on our doors to supply medicines instead of asking for votes. So thank you for relieving us from that constant electioneering fatigue which we've been through for the last 10 years. So other than that, what I would um, like to also emphasize is the, is the key message he gave. This is your health, your right. And very beautifully, he defined health is not just the physical and mental well-being, but also the economic, emotional, and social well-being. So in science, we've got this term that's called One Health. And One Health is defined as a multi-pronged approach to be able to bring animal, plants, humans, and the environment's health under one umbrella. But I suppose he's right when he says this definition ought to be extended to the economic health of this country, to the social health of this country, to the cohesion of this country. So thank you, sir, for um, a very enlightening speech. And lastly, I would I, I take that as a cue that you want me to finish the speech, which I well taken. Lastly, I would urge you as young voters to please make sure that you exercise your rights. It does not matter who you vote for. What's more important is that you actually go out there and vote. Because those of you who remain in that middle, neutral ground, who do not vote, are like people giving the, given the driving seat, and you're driving with your eyes closed. Imagine what happens to the passengers. You've got passengers who are victims of violence in Manipur. You've got passengers who are farmers. Uh, facing you know, the burden of drought and the financial hardships. So please be mindful of that. And lastly, one quick announcement. The minister has seen that a lot of people sitting upstairs did not get a chance to un uh, ask their questions. So we will be by the banyan tree for the next 10 to 15 minutes. If anyone's got further questions, you're more than welcome to interact with him there. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am, for so beautifully summarizing uh, Sir's talk. Gratitude is that humble expression that acknowledges the efforts of others in our lives as well as our life events. And now invite our Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ronald Mascarinus, to propose the vote of thanks. Sri Dinesh Gundurauji, Honorable Minister for Health and Family Welfare. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Reverend Dr. Victor Lobo. All officials of the university on the dais and off the dais, members of the staff, my dear students. This year, the World Health Day is centered around the profound theme, building a fairer and healthier world. It was indeed fitting to have our health minister address us. Many investments cannot be evaluated in terms of money or gains because some investments never make a profit, but still they make us rich. Personal health care is one among them. We extend our heartfelt gratitude to Sri Dinesh Gundurauji, the Honorable Health Minister, for sharing his valuable insights into citizen-centric governance in healthcare and beyond. His visionary perspective deeply resonates with us in a world striving for a fairer, healthier society. Sri Dinesh Gundurao's commitment to inclusivity, accessibility, and equity in healthcare, along with his emphasis on technology and innovation, inspires a transformative change. His dedication to fostering partnerships across sectors highlights the collaborative efforts that is needed to address public health challenges. We express our sincere thanks to you, dear Sri Dinesh Gundurauji, sir, for the enlightening address and unwavering commitment to social betterment. Shall we give him a round of applause? <laughs> we would like to express our gra gratitude to the Honorable Vice Chancellor of St. Joseph's University for his gracious presence and for delivering the presidential address. Thank you, Father. <laughs> the presence of all university officials is gratefully acknowledged. The university gratefully appreciates the efforts of Dr. Sweta Raghavan for organizing this function. A special thanks to our esteemed guests, invitees, members of the press and media, if there are faculty members, members of the organizing committee, students, and all participants for their valuable contribution to this event. Thank you one and all, and have a good day. Thank you, sir. I now request the audience to kindly rise for the national anthem. Thank you all. I request all of you all to remain standing as our dignitaries leave the auditorium.